Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another DXO webinar. It's so lovely to see you all again. Well, I can't see you, but you can hopefully see me. It has been a while. I've been away for all of August, but I am, well, most of August. It's now, what is it, the 30th today, 31st? Last day of August, I'm back for one webinar in August. So again, I'm Photo Joseph. Thank you for attending today's DxO webinar. Today's DxO webinar is titled, Working with Raw Images and Using DxO Smart Workspace to Personalize DxO Photo Lab. It's a lot of DxOs in there. So essentially what we're talking about today is using Photo Lab and kind of customizing it to work the way that you want to work. I'm going to show you how to find the tools that you're looking for, how to organize them. Well, first of all, just how to find them within the way that PhotoLab is initially set up, but then how to really customize it and organize them to work the way that you might want to work. It just, it really comes down to your personal preference. Do you want to just use the software the way it is, which honestly is how I usually use it, um, or do you want to completely customize your own personalized workspace, which of course you can make multiple workspaces for, which is quite cool. So let's say that you do, uh, let's say you're a wedding photographer, but you also do a lot of landscape work and you might use different tool sets for those. And you might want to set up a workspace that's just for when I'm working on wedding photos and just for when I'm working on landscape photos, totally up to you. And that's kind of what we're going to start with. Then once we get through that, I'm simply going to take a raw image or two. We'll see how timing goes and uh, and just edit them. And it's just be kind of a, a free edit session, if you will, where I'll go in and use the tools that we just talked about and look for the right tools to use for that particular image. And that's essentially what we're going to do. So with all that said, make sure that nothing is listed and nothing in the questions I need to get to. Um, any questions? So I see there's a question already about, uh, this is from Melissa asking, how long will we wait before PhotoLab updates to recognize the Nikon Z uh, FC? I guess that's a camera model. Um, so a brand new camera. I don't have a, an answer for you, but typically new cameras are supported fairly quickly. You have to understand that the process of supporting a new camera by any raw decoder this goes for adobe this goes for dxo this goes for apple typically doesn't happen until after the camera is shipping which seems completely backwards and bizarre but i've worked in this industry and for whatever reason the camera manufacturers don't generally like to give access to this stuff before it's shipping i know it makes no sense don't quite it just doesn't i don't know so what has to happen is the manufacturers have uh, the software manufacturers have to get that camera in hands and start working on supporting it um, in the case of DxO, of course, there's a lot more than just the raw decode. They also do all their lens profiling and all that work. So there's a lot that goes into it. Um, so I don't have an answer as to how long it will take. Obviously, they go as quickly as they can. And of course, they do prioritize a more popular camera model will likely get supported before a less popular model will. With all that said, you can always go to the DxO website. I can't remember the URL. I think it's is it dxo.com slash camera support or raw maybe it's camera slash raw maybe that's what it anyway you'll find it on the website there's a list of all the cameras and lenses that are currently supported and you can it'll usually tell you what the plan is for a particular model a new model if it's not there at all then there is a request thing you can submit a request and say hey we need this camera supported so so that's how that works so hopefully that helps um no easy answer unfortunately um same question I see that uh, Jackie is asking the same thing about the Mavic. Again, same question, same answer to that. And um, and then someone asking about Fuji. Now, Fuji is a different story. There's a whole thing on the DxO website about Fuji and why the x sensors are not currently supported. Um, and I believe that's still the case. It's honestly been a while since I've looked into it. So you might just need to dig in and look up the Fuji, specifically Fuji support on the DxO website for that. So, okay. With that said, let's get started, shall we? I am going to turn off my camera when I do the demos because that just, uh, just frees up your screen a little bit. And again, we've already kind of covered this, but what I will be covering, looking at the second block of text there, we're going to talk about how to select the tools, how to find the tools that you want by modifying the display, hiding the elements you don't want, and so on. And um, and then, of course, how to make some adjustments. So, you know, let's, let's just get into it, shall we? Much more exciting to do it that way. All right, here we go. Let's get started. So first thing I want to do is show you or draw your attention to this workspaces menu up at the top. You'll see by default, and I've kind of reset everything to its default, you have three options, DxO Standard, DxO Advanced, and what's new in PhotoLab. So starting with DxO Standard, what this is doing is customizing the workspace, really primarily the stuff on the side here, to show you 
a variety of tools and, and adjustments that are based off of, um, well, in this case, the standard workspace. And under the standard workspace, you'll find your basic tools, you know, white balance, exposure compensation, shadow to highlight control, some color stuff, and so on. This is a limited tool set. This is not everything. Unless you're really, really just getting started, I highly recommend going straight into the DxO Advanced. And when you open this one up, you get a lot more tools in here. You see here on the right, a whole bunch of additional tools in here. So this is the workspace that we're generally going to start with. I'm always in this workspace to begin with. So this is all this is doing is showing you more or less tools in here. There's also this one called What's New in Photolab. And this is quite good whenever there's an update to check this out because it'll pull up any new tools or anything that has new features in it since the most recent update. So that's kind of a good place to go if you just want to kind of get an idea of what's new or see if there's some totally new adjustments in there. I mean, you can see right here what's new in Photolab. It also includes the basic tools in here, but it shows you what's new since the last major update. Um, and that's just a nice way to kind of get into that if you want to. But again, for the most part, we're going to stick with the DxO Advanced. We will later on in this demo, we're going to get into saving your own custom workspace. But for now, we're going to start with this. OK, so DxO Advanced. What does this show us? We'll take a look on the right hand side here and you see a ton of different adjustments, different things that we can do. And you'll also notice that they're all collapsed, which actually, if I go back to the DxO standard, there is uh, there's fewer of them and uh, some of the main ones are open. By going to the advanced one, I think all of them, yeah, all of them are collapsed. And so it's really an easy way to see exactly what's here. You see all of them listed, but you have to open each one to see what's inside of it. So if you're unfamiliar with them, it can take a little while to kind of dig through all of these. Now, what you're looking at here is all of them, which can definitely be overwhelming. However, these filters across the top here, and these are filters, these are filters that filter down to show you just specific adjustments. This is where the real power lies. And this is where I personally have, find the tools that, I'm work, that I wanna work with. So the different categories you have here are light, color, you get a little tool pop up there, you see, detail, geometry, local adjustments, and watermark and effects. And the idea here being that if I click on this, I'm only gonna see adjustments that have to do with light. So things like exposure, smart lighting, selective toning, that's your mid-tone, uh, shadow highlights, uh, mid-tones control, clear view, contrast, tone curve, and so on. It's showing you just those that have to do with lighting. And you'll notice that when you filter by this, they're all open. So this is a big difference right there. When I turn that filter off, everything is closed. I open one of these and now everything is open. So it makes it much easier to glance to find the one you're looking for. For example, let's say you're looking for tone curves or you know you like to work with curves. Okay, if I close this, you're like, uh, yeah, curves. Where's the curve? Where's the curve? So go, oh, there's tone curve. Okay, I'll find it there, right? But when I do it this way, well, everything's open, so it's really quick and easy to find. If I am looking for my curves, chances are we're gonna find them under the light setting, having to do with exposure settings on your photo. And that's where we're gonna find that really quickly. If we go to the next one here, you'll see it's color. The color category has everything to do with color. So color accentuation, there's vibrancy and saturation. Color rendering, so you can even change the color rendering of the, of the file. Um, you've got your um, style toning here. So if you wanna go black and white or do a split tone to do a, uh, so let's just go ahead and, oops, let's turn that on here. Open that up, turn that on. Um, simple toning is gonna give you your black and white, give you a couple of extra presets in here, or you can do a sapia, stuff like that, all built in here under style toning. Again, obviously this has to do with color, the coloring of the image. HSL, your hue, saturation, and luminance feature. This is a very, very powerful color feature introduced in, um, I believe, the previous major version. And this, of course, is gonna fall under color as well. Then we look at the next category. The next one here is detail. Under detail, we're going to find things like our denoising. So if you want to get rid of some, uh, some nasty noise that's in your photo, you can use this to get rid of that. Your lens sharpness, chromatic aberration, so very much corrective tools in here. And then repairing, things like your, your retouching tools, your sharpening tools, your moray removal or your red eye removal. All of these show up under here. So again, it really comes down to these categories, right? I want to work on exposure stuff. My picture's too dark, too bright, underexposed shadows, whatever. I just jump into here, and right away I find all the tools that I might need for that. Going into, let's see, um, I always forget what some of these are called, geometry, focal length, right? So the focal length of the lens, if it needs manual correction, you can define that in here. Focusing distance, kind of a, an odd one to see, actually. If this really, again, comes down to, if um, 
if you need to do some corrections like sharpening, lens sharpening and so on, the, the software is not able to determine from the metadata, you can actually manually go in here and adjust these settings. Kind of, kind of an odd thing, but you have that capability. Horizon adjustments, cropping, distortion, so lens corrective distortion, that's all in here as well. Then you get into the local adjustments, which at the moment, this is just one single adjustment here, turn that on, and this is what gives me my local adjustments so I can do my control points and do specific localized adjustments there. So that's where that's gonna find, where you're gonna find that. And then the last one here, effects, is if you hover over it, it says watermarking and effects. You see right now, the only thing in here is watermarking. Um, I would imagine, and I'm not trying to tell you anything that's coming, I'm just saying what I would imagine is that at some point in the future, additional effects will start to show up in here, which would be kind of cool. So there's your basic run through of the categories and how to find them. So again, just to recap, if we set our workspace to advanced, that opens all of the tools that are in the software that I can get to. And then using these filters, I can quickly narrow it down to the category of filters that I want. And then I see everything available for that category. This is personally the way that I work. I like to go in here and just say, oh, what color tools do I have? And then I find the one that I want in here. But you can continue to refine this and come up with your own complete list. So here's, here's a couple different tools that we can use to refine this. Let's first talk about favorites. There are, um, actually, hold on, before I get into favorites, I wanna go into search first. Let's talk about search. Let's just say that you cannot find the one that you're looking for. Let's say, for example, I want to do saturation. I'm looking through the list here and let's go to color. It's gotta be in here somewhere. And okay, it's right there under color accentuation, but you know, I missed that. I, I just, I, where, where, where's my saturation? I cannot find it anywhere. Well, if I go up here and I just type in saturation, then sure enough, look at that, there's saturation right at the top. And actually it shows me that saturation can be found under color accentuation, which is going to be a global saturation. You can see the whole image is being affected there. Let's turn that off. I also have saturation under the HSL controls. So if I, let's open that. Let's say in this photo, I wanna saturate the reds, just the red of his shirt. I can go to my reds in here, take the saturation and saturate just the reds in there. So I have this localized saturation, which is really cool because maybe I didn't even realize this existed, but I typed in saturation and now I see everything that's got saturation to it. Okay, cool, what else has saturation? Oh, local adjustments, oh, that's interesting. So I can go in here and let's say I want to, um, well, actually let's go back to the same demo that I was just doing. Turn HSL on here, I saturate my reds. I just wanna saturate his shirt, but ooh, look at that, all the tops of these um, jars here are also getting picked up. These red peppers or whatever that is, flowers, I guess, are also getting picked up, mm, not what I wanted. So maybe I go, well, in that case, maybe I need to do a local adjustment. So I go into local adjustments, let's drop, drop a control point on his shirt, bring that down. And let's see here, under here, I've got exposure or lightness controls, color controls and detail controls. Let's go to color there's saturation, now I can bring the saturation up for that range in there. So you have a lot of different ways to find your saturation. The whole point of this is simply showing that when you search for a tool by typing in something like saturation, you might find additional ways to do things than you even realized were there. So it's even, even if you know where saturation is, it can be a quite a cool way to go, hmm, okay, I want to change the saturation of part of my image, but what's the best way to do that? Well, type it in, see what tools include saturation and start playing with those. Great way to learn things. Let's try another one. Let's go in here and I'll type in shadows. Let's say I want to lift the shadows on my image. Well, shadows, here our basic shadow control, lives under something called selective tones. If, let me reset this, I go back to the main view in here, I'm scrolling through this list and I'm like, are you kidding me? I have no idea where shadows are, right? Let's collapse this. I, I, where's where's shadows? It's under selective tone, but that may not be obvious to me that that's where it is. So I can't find it. I'm getting annoyed. I can't figure out where that is. So I go up here and I type in shadow and there it is right at the top, selective tone, shadow control. So now if I wanted to lift my shadows, I keep clicking on the name and collapsing it. If I wanted to lift my shadows, I could go in there and do, or darken the shadows. I just want to darken my shadows. I can do it from there. This, just like with saturation, it is showing me other places that shadows show up. Okay, local adjustments, all right, cool. We already saw that where we had saturation control. I can do shadow control in there as well. But this is interesting. It shows contrast. Even though it's searching for shadow, this contrast adjustment has come up. There's a contrast and there's a micro contrast, but there's nothing about shadow in here. So where's the shadow coming from? I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but every one of these tools on the top right corner has yeah, yeah, a little question mark. If you click on that, it gives you a whole bunch of information about the tool. It's kind of cool, you know, kind of gives you some guidance on how it works, what it does and so on, which is super powerful. So if you just don't know what something is or you're not sure how it works, it's like a little built-in help system. 
But as you scroll through this, you'll see that there is actually shadow control for contrast, increase or decrease contrast in the shadow specifically, but it also tells you that this is an extra setting that requires Film Pack 5 Elite to be installed. So with Film Pack 5 Elite installed, which I currently don't have installed, then you would have additional controls in here. So that's pretty slick, actually. So you just learned that that's a you know, way to get some additional tools in here. Nice. Okay. So that's how you find things when you don't know what, what you're looking for. You know what you're looking for, but you don't know where it is. You just type it in up there, and this is a great way to find your tools. Okay, so we've talked about where they are in general and filtering by individual categories and how to find individual ones by typing into here. But then there is the favorites. So let's go to favorites next. With favorites, I can star the ones that I like most. So for example, here, I've already starred Tone Curve because I personally really like using, you can rearrange these, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. You can, um, I really like using Tone Curves. That's kind of the first place that I tend to go for a lot of my work. And so I use this a lot, so I've marked that as a favorite. Scrolling down more, I have also marked color accentuation as a favorite. I tend to go into vibrancy and saturation quite a bit. So there's my uh, there's my color accentuation. I've starred that one. I also really like the HSL tool, so I've starred that as a favorite. Uh, let's see, I've also added a star to denoising. That's the other one that I've added a star to. Okay, so I've got all these stars on here. So what, what does that do for me? Well, what it does is if I click on this star right here, I'm only going to see the adjustments that I have starred. I'm only gonna see my favorites. So right here, we've built a very kind of ad hoc, impromptu, short list of the adjustments that I want. This, you know, here I've done it as kind of a general, I've starred the ones that I always use, but let's say you're going through and you're like, um, okay, so I, I'm probably gonna do some smart lighting. Maybe I do this. I go in and I go, yeah, I, I kind of like smart lighting. Okay, let's. I'm just gonna tag that because I'm probably gonna come back to that. Um, Tone curve, yeah, I'm probably gonna work on that, so I've tagged that, let's see what else. Um, I'm not gonna denoise this one, it's a clean image, so I'm gonna turn that off. And uh, let's say this image had some chromatic aberration showing up in there. It doesn't, well, let's pretend that it did. Okay, so I know that I'm gonna wanna tag that one. Now that I've tagged those adjustments, I go in here and I have all the ones that I thought, I'm probably gonna wanna work with those, and now they're all in here. And if I wanna get rid of one, I just unstar it, and it immediately disappears from this list because, again, I'm filtered by favorites, I've just unfavorited that. The last adjustment or the last filter up here is um, active, it's called active corrections. It's the ones that you've already applied. And this is really handy because, let me go back to the top of this. Uh, let's see here, everything's reset, yeah. Okay, so back at the top here, there's so much stuff, right? So many adjustments that we can do in here. And you might be looking at this going, well, I don't, what's already been applied? Obviously the ones with the blue box are what's been applied, but I just wanna see the ones that I've already applied an effect to. And it's worth pointing out that a lot of these are on automatically because when I reset this image, all of these adjustments are being automatically applied by the software. So the software has automatically done a white balance, potentially. It's already automatically done some color rendering, potentially. Again, it's not necessarily done, but it has potentially done it. All of these things that have been done on here, if I wanna see exactly what's been affected, I can turn this on and filter only by adjustments that have been already made, and now I can see what is being applied in here. Now, in case you're you're looking at this and you've never really played with the photo lab before and you're thinking, whoa, hold on a minute, what did you just say? Why are these adjustments applied automatically? Let me just recap that very briefly in here. If I go into the preferences of the app and I go under, uh, let's see, under the general, there's a default preset applied to new raw images, and by default, when you first install the software, it applies something called DxO standard. And the DxO standard is the, the default, this is what Photolab is going to do to your image to try to make it better. It's like it does the raw processing and then it does a bunch of basic correction on top of that. If you don't want it to do that, you can set this to no correction. When you set it to no correction, a new image will have nothing applied to it. So if I do that and now I hit reset, let's see here, I think I have to change something, hit reset, um, actually, I guess it would be a new image entirely. It would have no corrections applied to it at all, but the way the software is designed to be used is with this standard preset applied, and then you get all the basics applied to your image automatically. So that's a pretty pretty important thing to understand. This is why there's all this stuff already applied to it. That's how the base image uh, is meant to look. This is how the software first interprets the image. It applies all these effects to it, and if you wanna see what's being applied, that's right there. Okay, so that's that's the basics of finding the tools that you want, refining it, and building an ad hoc list. Next, next we're gonna get into customizing that list, but before I do that, I am going to take a moment to scroll through the questions and see if there's anything in here. Alrighty, so, 
Um, oh, thank you. Somebody in the, see, I guess nobody else is going to get this. Um, somebody in the chat has post, posted the link for the supported cameras. I'm going to drop this into the chat. There we go. So it's dxl.com slash supported dash cameras. That'll show you a list of all the cameras that are available. Um, thank you very much, George, for supplying that for me. I appreciate that. Let's see here. Um, ooh, interesting question. Dennis is asking, do you support, does Photolab support, um, uh, so extenders and converters, let's say like a 1.4x extender. I actually don't know. That's a really good question. I I don't own any extenders. I have had a couple in the studio that I've done some sample images with. Um, I, I couldn't look them up quickly enough to really to just answer that question for you on the fly. But once again, going to that web page, which now has been linked into there, into the uh, chat or into the uh, yeah, into the chat room. I would search in there and see if it shows. I don't actually know, and I'm sorry that I don't know the answer to that. That's a really good question. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to look at that afterwards. Ajil is asking if I can explain Moray. I can explain it. I don't have a sample image here to show it to you, but effectively Moray is what happens where you have a very fine grid. So it could be as something like a flannel shirt that has a fine pattern on it. It could be something like a screen on a window, like a, you know a window screen to keep the bugs out. When you take a picture of it, sometimes you see what appears to be radial uh, patterns showing up in that grid pattern. That is moray. When you see a pattern that should not be there because there already is a pattern, but the pattern is so fine that the software is kind of misinterpreting it, then um, that's moray. And so a moray removal will allow you to try to get rid of that or at least minimize that. So that's what moray is. It can show up in a lot of different places, but essentially anywhere there's a really fine pattern, then it has to do with the resolution of the sensor. When the pattern of let's say screen window, right? That's kind of the easiest one to think about. It's a very fine grid of lines of a dark line and then a light line where there's, you're seeing you know, behind the window and then a dark line where there's a screen and then where there's a little wire and then behind it again. When that fine grid becomes more fine than the resolution of the photo, where basically every line is less than a pixel, then you get into sub-pixel space and things tend to blend together and give weird patterns. That's more A, so there you go. Um, Kevin is asking, how do I add vignette to my photo? Curiously, nah, I can't explain why, but curiously, there the only vignetting tool that's built into Photolab by default is the um, is the vignette removal. Creative vignetting is something that you get when you add, I think Film Pack 5 adds that in, but um, it's not part of it by default, which is strange, but, um, but there you go, sorry. A couple more questions and then we're gonna jump back in. Is there a way to view in the color space for printing paper and ink combinations so you can keep the imaging gamut? The, the print capabilities of Photolab are a bit minimal. So, um, and I'm not a printer. I don't print ever on my own. So as far as I understand it, there really isn't. It's not like Photoshop where I know you have kind of simulated color spaces that you can do on screen. Um, I, I believe the answer is there really isn't anything in there for that, but I could be wrong because again, that is definitely not my world. Uh, so don't take my word for it. Dig into it a little bit, but I think the answer is gonna be no. Well, let's see here. Colin says, what is the slider button to the right of the correction search field? Oh, we got to that. That was the slider button. That was the, um, let me go back to this. This one up here that is showing you the effects that have already been um, applied. So active corrections. And all right, oh, ooh, there's a bunch more questions. All right, I'm gonna kind of skim through these to see if there's, if I can get to these. Um, Robert says, filter for the film strip at the bottom window. How do you set a preset of only some filters? Oh, I think what you're asking is if you're filtering, I only have three images in here, so this isn't a really good filter. But if you're looking for a way to combine these as a, a like a saved search, there isn't. But what you can do is go to the photo library and search for criteria in here and then save that as a search. Um, or I guess it shows up as the most recent search. So that might do what you're looking for. But as far as what I think you're asking down here, there's not a way to build a preset for that. Um, Robert says, does DxO standard equate to auto in Photoshop? I'm guessing you're asking, sort of. Um, just keep in mind that, okay, so the short answer is yes. It, it is the same as doing an auto, where the software is doing its best to make a correction that it thinks is what you might want. Photolab does a lot more than Photoshop because it has all the lens profiling in it. So it is doing things that are unique to that 
camera and lens combination that Photoshop does not do. And so that's, uh, that's where you're gonna find some significant advantages over image correction in PhotoLab. That is part of that auto package. Oh, um, someone is saying, Aki is saying that uh, extenders are supported. Oh, excellent. David's saying, I have a Canon 1.4X extender and PhotoLab has modification settings combined with Canon EF lenses. Superb, thank you guys for answering that. Very, very cool. Does PhotoLab include pure raw? If not, what is the difference between raw processing and PhotoLab and pure raw? Yes, it includes everything that's in pure raw. Pure raw is a standalone, basically pure raw is a component of PhotoLab. It's the raw decoding with all the lens profiling and the advanced denoising technology all as a standalone app. PhotoLab has everything that pure raw has. Um, uh, let's see here, all right. Some teleconverters are supported. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Um, oops, let's see here. Okay, very quickly, I'm gonna scan through the rest of these. Um, <laughs> Mike, that's cute. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore. <laughs> that's awesome, good one. That's, I'm gonna have to remember that next time somebody asks what more is, I'm gonna say, well, when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, uh, that's amore. That's good, I'm gonna have to remember that. I like that, thank you, Mike. Okay. Um, what advantage does PhotoLab have over Lightroom Classic? A ton of things. I've actually done videos comparing Lightroom Classic to PhotoLab, so I encourage you to watch those. Again, photojoseph.com slash getdxo is a great place to look at that. Okay, um, all right, I am going to, uh, someone's saying for vignetting, use the Nick collection. Great way to do it, but you're taking it out of PhotoLab if you wanna do it in PhotoLab directly. Again, I think FilmPack adds that in. Okay, uh, all right, I need to move on to through the next step of the demo and then we'll come back to some more, um, come back to some more. Okay, oh, Colin says there's vignetting sliders in the effects menu, that is because you have something else added. So I believe again, coming from uh, film pack is why you would see that there. As you can see here, I don't have that and mine is set to its default. Okay, now show off the camera and let's move on to the next stage of this, which is making a totally custom workspace. So let me reset everything in here. I'm gonna make sure that everything is set back to default and it is, okay. So first of all, take a look over here on the right and you'll see that there are these palettes. There's a light palette, which can be collapsed, a color palette, a detail palette, a geometry. These do coincide with these filtering, okay? But these are individual palettes that are actually customizable. There's a few things we can do in these. I can rearrange them. So let's say I just want vignetting higher up the list. I want white balance down at the bottom of that list. I can, I can rearrange that however I like. I can close one of these. I can say, you know what? I don't care about detail. I'm gonna close that out entirely. I can rearrange the entire palette. Let's take color and move that to the top. Now I have color and then light. I can even tear this off of here and drag it out here and now color is a floating palette. So if I've got a dual screen display, I can whoop, drag this off to another screen and put it over there for me. I can even put it over here on the left-hand side. So I go, you know what? I want my color to be over here on the left while all the other stuff is on the right. Total control over these. I can close that and disappear entirely. And then when I go, uh-oh, I don't know where anything is anymore. I go back to workspace, load up DxO Advanced, and bada bing, bada boom, everything comes back again. So you have that kind of customization over your workspace. You can even go in here and add things to it. So let's say in light, I actually also want to include um, uh, yeah, I don't know, chromatic aberration. Why not? Okay, it has nothing to do with lighting, but I just decided that I want that in there. So I can add that in. Okay, that's cool. Oh, made a mistake. Let's get rid of that. Let's go back and just turn off chromatic aberration. There we go. So I can customize these palettes. But what's really cool is you can make your own palette. So to do that, go to the palette menu and you'll see in here, there's a bunch of palettes and you see them all in here, right? Light, color, and so on. They're all here, but I can make a new one. So let's make a new one and I'll call this one Photo Joseph. Hit OK. And it creates a new floating palette with nothing in it. What do I want in my custom palette? Well, let's just add some of my favorite tools in here. Let's see here. Um, clear view is pretty cool. I'll put that in there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's add the denoising. Always awesome. Adding the denoising in there. Ooh, HSL, definitely a good one. Let's add that in there. And I'll add my curve. Let's add tone curve in there as well. Uh, you know, one other one, and this is kind of part of my scripted demo here. Let's just say I want to add my highlights and shadows in here. But remember, I'm like, okay, it's highlight. Um, e, F, A, H. Uh, nothing under highlight. Okay, that's weird. Shadows. Um, R, F, S. Nothing under shadow. Where is highlight and shadow? I can't, I have no idea. Where is it? Don't know. Remember, I can go over here and type, type it in. Shadow. Oh, it's called selective toning. Okay, so let's go in here and go, whoop, doo, doo, selective toning. There it is. Now I've got selective toning in there. Okay. So let's see, let's get rid of Clearview Plus. I don't really want that one in there. 
let's get rid of that one. Um, I'm going to collapse all of these so I can see them and rearrange them more easily. I'm going to put selective toning at the top and let's put denoising at the bottom because that's kind of the last thing I would do. Uh, tone curve. There we go. So there's my custom palette. Excellent. I have my own little custom workspace now. Now with this in place here, I can put this into my, um, I can dock this, right? I can go over here and I can say dock to the left or dock to the right and it'll pop that in. Oop, let's get rid of that clear that out there we go it is now docked that to the right where is it at the bottom or i can do that manually i can just i don't have to use the menu in here that's just a way to do it i can take this and go right i'm going to move these over here to the left those are the ones that i always use and in fact i just want to hide this all together so i'll click this little wall there and that hides that down and now i just have one column of stuff so i can customize my space like that or i can drag this over here and say you know what i don't want any of these let's just get rid of light get rid of color get rid of detail get rid of geometry get rid of local get rid of watermark and all i want in here is my own pretty custom list and there we go i've got my own custom list in there so that's cool i made my own like a whole new workspace in here but if i go up here right now and i choose this it is going to reset it so let's save this workspace so i'll save this we'll call it photo joseph there we go i've now saved my own custom workspace so now i can go back to dxo advanced and there's everything that we saw before and i can go back to my workspace and there's my new ones okay so let's say this is my custom workspace but i'm like oh i like you know i want these open okay let's open these all right let's open each one of these up so that i can see everything cool all right so then i'm working away like that and then i go back over here to my dxo advanced because i'm doing something else and then i go back to my custom one and they're all closed i wanted them to be open well the state that these are in open or closed is actually part of the saved workspace so let's do this i'll open hsl um oops, not rearrange it i'll open hsl and i'll open selective toning actually let's do this let's open tone curve so curve and hsl those are open selective tone and denoising are closed now let's save the workspace again there's no update workspace option but if i go save workspace and i type in the same name photo joseph and hit save it'll say do you want to overwrite that i do and now i've got a updated workspace so if i go to advanced it goes back to that space if i go to photo joseph it goes to that space with those two open and all the same filters still work in here right so i've got my own custom workspace but i only want to see the ones that have to do with light control um okay i just totally lied to you that does not continue to filter on that i'm sorry this i believe still works the favorites no that still pulls them up Okay, all right, well, I'm totally lying to you. For some reason, I was thinking that it did, but it doesn't. So when you're in this space, that's actually kind of cool. When I'm in this space, I've got the four tools that I regularly want, but now I want to find all my color tools. I click on there, and there's all my color tools. Super. I love it when a mistake turns into a teaching lesson. There we go. Look at that. Everybody learned something. So you have this total customized capability. Now, here's a bit of a gotcha on this. Something I want to show you to kind of warn you about this. So I've built this palette called Photo Joseph, right? And I've got this one that I've saved. And let's just say that I decide I, I no longer like this workspace. Um, under my palettes, there's my Photo Joseph palette, but I no longer want this workspace. So I'm going to delete that workspace. All right, delete. All right, now let's pull up my Photo Joseph palette again. Um, oop, it's there. Isn't that interesting? You know, go back to DxO Advanced. Oh, I, I didn't change it. Okay, sorry. So I deleted the workspace and then I went to Advanced, right? to go back to my default and now photo joseph is gone so here's the lesson here's the learning lesson in here when i create a new palette test i'll just add something to this real quick uh crop okay so i create a new palette and then i save this as a new workspace test two save that as a new workspace and then i decide uh you know i can close that palette right i can bring this back up at any time test there's that palette and then i decide you know what i don't really like this test workspace let's just delete that workspace don't like it don't care about that one. I want to go back to my DXO advanced workspace, but I still want my test palette. It's gone. So the palette was saved as part of the workspace. If you don't save that palette as the workspace, then that palette will be gone. So if I, let's just do another one here with test one, two, three, and I'll add something else in here, add HSL to that. And now I go to my DXO standard. And now I go back to DXO advanced and that test workspace is a uh, palette is gone. So super, super important. If you're gonna spend the time to create a custom palette, you also want to take the moment to create a custom workspace. Otherwise, as soon as you select one of these workspaces, that palette will disappear, which can definitely be a bit of a bummer. So just super important to make sure that you don't forget how uh, to do that.
Okay, that is everything that I wanted to show you as far as customizing your workspace. Again, you can find, this is kind of recap really quickly, you can go back to your default advanced workspace, which shows all of your tools in here. I can filter through just the categories that I want in here. I can filter by just my favorites. So I can say, just show me my favorites, just show me the ones that are applied. And by the way, these filters, if I didn't mention this earlier, these are combinable. So here's my starred favorites, right? If I look at these, the only one of these that is currently turned on is chromatic aberration. If I combine that with this, I'm seeing just my favorites that have been applied. So there's just chromatic aberration. I can say, just show me the ones that have been applied under color white balance and color rendering. So you can see how these filters can be combined together to really refine what you're looking for. Um, and then of course, searching by searching for um, any plain English word in there to find what you're looking for and so on. So th that's the stuff that I wanted to show you in here. Um, I'm gonna come back to the questions for a bit and then we'll, um, we don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm just gonna go in and we'll adjust one of the photos just to have some fun with it. All right, let's see here. There's uh, not a huge amount of questions. Let's see if I can get through these. Um, did I skip any from before? Uh, not quite sure. I understand this question. Um, uh, Gregors is asking, can I permanently select a lens profile? The program constantly asks about the choice. Oh, between two Nikon lenses. Oh, right. Hmm. I know what you're talking about. So what happens is, Stepping back for a moment, for anybody who's wondering who's, who's going to question the next part of the statement. Um, when you import a photo that's obviously shot with a camera and a lens, as a photo must be, the software identifies that camera and lens and says, all right, here's the profile for that camera and lens combination. The way it gets that information, the way it knows what it is, is from the metadata in the file, right? When you look at the EXIF data in a photo, it tells you this was shot with a um, you know, Panasonic Lumix G9 and it was shot with the 50 to 200 millimeter lens. Okay, so it knows that from there. Sometimes, especially on older cameras, older lenses, that metadata is perhaps a bit unclear. It's a bit vague. Um, like it might say in, in this example, um, he's saying a Nikon, a uh, Nikkor 70 to 300 lens. Nikon has probably come out with multiple 70 to 300 lenses. And maybe one of the older lenses they came out with, when they embedded the metadata, it just said 70 to 300 lens. And let's just say that it was an F4. I have no idea. Let's just say it was an F4 lens. And then they came out with another lens that was a 70 to 300 F4 to 5.6. Well, now they're like, oh, okay, now we need to include that in the metadata, 74 uh, to 56. But the older lens is still getting embedded as just a 70 to 300. So the software goes, okay, we can tell that you've got a 70 to 300 lens, but we don't know which one. And so it'll pop up a little thing saying, ooh, which lens, which lens are you actually using? And you have to manually choose it. The question here that Gregors is asking is, can you set that to be a default? I'm pretty sure that you can. I seem to recall that there's an option when you're choosing it to always choose that, but I don't know and I don't have an easy way to pull it up and test it out for you. Um, next time you have to do that, really look closely around at all the options. I really think there is a way to do it, but I can't promise you. So sorry, um, but hopefully that kind of sort of helps. Um, all right. Someone's asking if the CR3 files from Canon are supported. Again, you're gonna have to go to that list. I don't know. Go to that um, dxo.com slash supported dash cameras page. Look for a camera that has, shoots those files and see, off you go. Um, I don't know what the CR3 file is otherwise, sorry. Uh, how can I, Leslie's asking, how can I filter separately portrait from landscape? Orientation you're talking about? I don't know if you can. Um, I don't know if you can, let's see here. So I'm looking in the filtering, processed modules. No, I don't think there's a way to filter portrait and landscape oriented photos. Maybe you can sort by it. Um, camera body lens rank, no, no. I don't think that's a thing. Sorry, sorry. How, oh, although I wonder, no, no, sorry. Okay, Frank's asking, how can I reduce, eliminate glitter shine in portraits due to hard sun influence? Ooh. If you have shine on someone's head, if that's what you mean, you're trying to get rid of that, um, retouching. I mean, you can try to reduce it with highlight reduction, but if it's a blown out area, if it's a clipped area, and you really want to eliminate it, then you're just gonna have to retouch, go in there and kind of retouch it one little piece at a time. In your presentation, can you teach how and where to paint with sunlight in Photolab? Ooh, not today. Um, and that would be something we would use localized adjustments for. And that would be, that's about as far as I can get for you today, because I don't have time to go deep into that. But you would be doing that with the localized adjustments and the brushing tools. All right. I'll be getting a new computer in a few weeks. Congratulations. Can the custom workspace palettes be moved to another computer? Yes. Uh, where are those saved? Um, ooh. 
I don't recall offhand. If you if you ask me this question on Twitter later, so I'm photo Joseph on Twitter, publicly message me on Twitter and just ask how where that is saved. It's in the settings on the preferences or somewhere in the library. I don't remember offhand, but I can find it for you and send you a screenshot. Just ask me on Twitter. How do I reset my DXO4 after customizing and needing to start again? Um, so that's, I mean, you have these customized resets here, right? These are permanent. These DXO standard and advanced, those are permanent. So if you just choose one of those, it resets that. If you want to like delete all the preferences, all the settings, then dig into the settings, uh, dig into the library, into the preferences, and you'll find a variety of preferences for PhotoLab. Just trash them all and, uh, and that'll get rid of everything, reset everything. Is there a Photoshop levels equivalent in PhotoLab? There is not a levels setting, a level slider curves, it handles everything that levels does and then some. How to move palettes to another display, um, you can just drag it off, can't you? I said that you could earlier, but I didn't actually do it. I'm just gonna drag it off to mine. Oh, oh, does that not actually work? I'm, oh, no, no, it works. Okay, that was weird. The first time I did it, it didn't, but I just did it again and it did. So obviously I can't show you that because I can only share one screen here. But um, yeah, I, the first one I did like disappeared. That was weird. But the second one I did, it is now off on the second display. And I'm going to drag it back just to prove it. See, there's color. It's back again. Just drag it over. Um, exporting or saving, not in today's workshop. Sorry, Mason. Um, but there's a you go to the export menu and, and you have your options. Sorry, I don't have time to dive into that. Um, I guess... It's probably more important to go through questions than it is to just demo editing a photo. So let me see if I can get through some more of these. After working on an image in PhotoLab and then want to work on it in Photoshop, what is the best format to save it as a TIFF file? Export it as a TIFF, 8-bit or 16-bit. 16-bit is going to give you more headroom. So if you are planning on doing additional highlight recovery and things like that, then definitely move it over as 16-bit. If you've already brought your image fully into range, when you're just bringing it to Photoshop to do some subtle color changes or something like that, 8-bit is fine. Given the cheap price of storage these days, I'm not particularly concerned. I basically do everything as 16-bit, but if you are, then you can go as 8-bit and you have a smaller file. Um, but you just export it as a TIFF and then open that in Photoshop. Is there a way, Dennis is asking, is there a way to add and edit keywords? Oh, absolutely. If so, where does PhotoLab save these in the image or in an external file? Okay, so adding keywords is just over here. Uh, Where's the keyword list? Preset editor, uh, metadata. Where's the keyword list? Move, zoom, history. Oh, keywords, here it is, it's collapsed. So here's keywords. So you can see the keywords are um, already saved for some of these files. Let's go back to this one here, and there we go. So there's keywords, so you add it, you just go in here and you type in um, new key, and boom, there becomes a new keyword. It is not embedded in the master file. I believe that it is part of the .dop file, which is the sidecar file, if you will, uh, that comes with, that is part of PhotoLab. I believe that's where that's stored. Um, but I couldn't promise you that. But it is not stored into the file itself. The original raw file remains untouched. Important, important thing to understand. Uh, Larry's saying a CR3 is a compressed raw file. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, I have no idea. Oh, uh, but Blair is saying CR3 files are supported by DXO. Arno is confirming. Excellent, thank you very much, you guys. Does DXO support third-party lenses? Okay, yes. So if it is a, let's say like a, I don't know, Tamron lens on a Nikon body, um, you know what, take yes out of that out of that response. Let's replace that with, I'm pretty darn sure. Maybe somebody else will respond who actually uses those kind of lenses, but um, I'm pretty darn sure it does, but I can't promise you 100%. Now, if you are using an old vintage lens that doesn't have any electronic contacts, so the camera has no way of knowing what lens is on the camera, then there's going to be no profiling for those. I personally shoot with a lot of vintage lenses. I just love them. And so a lot of my photos can't be processed fully by photo. I mean, the photo lab, it reads them. I find it, it decodes the raw and it's all there, but I don't get to take advantage of automatic lens corrections because the camera, uh, the software has no idea what lens was on there and they haven't profiled all these old vintage lenses. So, um, in that regards, it won't work, but in regards to third party lenses like Tamron or Sigma or so on, pretty darn sure, but I'm sure somebody's going to respond. Um, uh, all right. Charles, Adobe Bridge allows sorting by orientation. Oh, interesting. Um, I know it's not a DXO product, but it may help the other user. Bridge is free to download and use too. Oh, I didn't know it was free. That's cool. Um, so there you go. So Adobe Bridge will do that. Thank you, Charles, for that tip. 
Um, let's see here. Robert says, if using two computers, can you share photo lab between the computers? Yeah, I think that the license allows you to install it on, on multiple computers. It's kind of the, you know, gen most software licenses are, are meant for a desktop and a laptop kind of a thing. But um, but yeah, I'm, I know you can install it on multiples. I've got it on you know multiple computers here, no problem. Um, Ananth says, once processed in Photolab, do you still need to move to Photoshop for anything and why? So it's a personal choice, right? And there are things that Photoshop does that Photolab does not. There's things that Photolab does that Photoshop does not. So if there are things that you wanna do in Photoshop, then by all means, off you go. Uh, yeah, Photolab is never claims to be the ultimate end all be all, does absolutely everything. There are things that Photoshop does. And so sometimes you need to use both. That's just the way it is. Um, obviously, you know, all these apps cost money. And clearly I understand that and not everybody can afford to have every single app installed. But if you do have multiple apps installed, if you're using Photoshop and Photolab, then often it just comes down to a, a preference of how one app treats your photo versus another. Sometimes you'll take a photo and you open it in Photoshop and you open it in Photolab and you'll love the way it's, it's rendered in Photolab and another photo you might prefer the way it comes out of Photoshop. So there's just even that level of it. Things like retouching, um, you know, ret there is retouching in Photolab for sure. Photoshop's retouching tools are pretty freaking awesome. So, uh, you know, sometimes if you've got some really advanced retouching, you might want to take it into Photoshop to do that if you have both apps. So th there's there's some reasons. Uh, let's see here. Um, Dean Waller, do you recommend any particular make or system of external storage for your photos? Uh, I pr I'm a big fan of, of OWC's hardware. So other world computing, OWC, I have multiple raids made by them. I would recommend looking at them. That is not a sponsored endorsement, it's just a personal choice. Are you using Apple? Yes, I'm on a Mac. My W10 screen, I guess it's Windows 10 screen view is slightly different. Okay, all the black title ribbons do not have the drop down, only a delete. The black title ribbons. You're on this little drop down? Well, it has to be there. Otherwise, I'm not sure how you would control what's in there. Um, that's odd, but not being a Windows user, I cannot accurately. Maybe somebody else um, who's watching, who's using a PC. So if I understand the question that Andrew is asking, he's saying that on his palettes, he's not having this drop down, which seems very strange to me. Um, I wonder if it could be something as simple as the window is off ever so slightly. So like if I move the window over a little bit, you see it? I mean, that sounds pretty simple, but um, uh, another Windows user perhaps can uh, chime in on that. I'm sorry, I'm, I am on a Mac and I do not use this on a Windows machine. All right, where are we in time? We got, we got like five minutes left. I need to end a couple minutes uh, before the hour. Sebastian says, I have a question belonging to the, I have a question about palettes, I guess. Um, is the drop down menu on the right side? Oh, somebody else asking it on Windows. Okay, so that's a second person saying it's not in Windows. Interesting. Oh, do, do, do. Let's see here. Uh, Philip, uh, how do I toggle or view the original image to compare? Oh, that's a good question. Um, um, that is the compare button right here. So let's go, let me just do something dramatic to this. Um, here, let's go into color and make this black and white. There we go. Up here, there's a button called compare. Press and hold that and it'll show you the before and after. So that is a button up there. There's a keyboard shortcut is D. So hold down and just press and hold. There we go. Press and hold down D key and that will toggle that. Um, Raul, will Photolab be available to process Fuji film? Talked about it in the beginning. Um, I, as far as I know, Fuji is still not supported. It has to do with the X-Trans sensor style. That's a question for DxO. Look on their website. I know there's an article about why it's not supported there. Um, oh, excellent, Manfred. Uh, Manfred has provided the location of the um, of the saved workspaces. They're stored in the user library under application support slash DxO photo lab version four slash workspaces. So let's just do that. I'm gonna to go to the finder. So again, this is Mac. Um, I'm gonna hit the go command, which has popped up elsewhere on my screen. Where is that? <laughs> I don't even know where it went. Where did my go command go? All right, we'll just do it the old fashioned way. Let's go back to the finder, new window. All right, so new window, home. Um, we need to go to the library, which you can't get to under uh, from here normally. Let's see if you go to the go menu. All right, so I have library re uh, revealed. I think if you don't see it, if you hold on the option key, then it'll show library. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. I've set it in my settings to always show it. Anyway, you go into the library and then he's saying you go into application support. So there's application support. Let's open that. And then he's saying you go into DxO photo lab. So we'll go down to DxO photo lab four. There it is. Open that. And then workspaces. Look at that. There we are. 
So there's my favorite. So if I made a new one in here, let's just save a new one test. And there it is. Look at that test doc workspace. Superb. Thank you ever so kindly. So again, the path to that user, your user folder, um, library, application support, photo lab, and then workspaces. Superb. Thank you, Manfred. You are most helpful. Okay. Uh, how do you actually move an image from Photo Lab to Photoshop? Well, you can do it like this. There's this export to disk button. To the right of that, you'll see a little share menu. Click on that and it has export to and a variety of different options um, that were previously used. If I choose export to application, then I can select any application that I want. So I would say the first time I do it, I go to browse, I go to my apps folder, I go to Photoshop. There we go. Photoshop, select that. Boom, and then I can choose what style I want. TIFF, um, we'll do 16-bit, because I said I like to use 16-bit. I don't want to resize it, and no profile, so there we go. Now I hit export, and off she goes. It's gonna get rendered. We see a little progress here, how long it takes to render that out. And then it will launch Photoshop for me, yeah, which is gonna take a moment. While it's doing that, let's go to the next question. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Can the keywords be changed on the photo library screen or just on the customized screen? Just in the customized screen. Uh, last time you opened Photoshop, it was force quit. Fantastic. There you go. Jerry C says, can photos be combined in DxO? No, no, it is not a compositing tool, so you will not find that in there. Um, okay, so there's that's how we get into Photoshop. So now that we've done it once, let's, um, I'm just gonna close this, close that, okay, blah, 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 um, okay. Back to Photo Lab. Um, now there is, if I go export to application, by the way, this button shows you what you previously did. So I chose export to application. So that is now the button. If I then go in here and I say export to disk, this button will change to that. So now when I go to export to application, Photoshop is there because I previously chose it. I could clear out that history or add another list, uh, add another app to that list. That's how that works. Um, ba -ba -bum. I can confirm Dennis says it is not there on Windows. Well, that is very, very strange. I don't know how you are meant to customize the palettes. Even if you make a new palette, you don't have this. That is maybe right click. What happens if you right click on Windows on this palette? Does that then give you this list? Because without that list, that kind of renders that whole part of the thing unusable. Try right clicking. Thank you. Somebody let me know. Uh, bu -bu. Let's see here. Ah, uh, Richard is saying this is not a question, but just to say that PhotoLab 4 does does recognize third-party lenses and brings in the lenses module for third-party lenses. Example, Sigma, Sigma or Tamron. I thought so. Thank you very much for confirming, Richard. Much appreciated. Um, uh, okay, let's see here. Um, Hank is saying um, I have an R5. I think that's a Canon. I would like PhotoLab as default to use my camera and colors. Right now I have to select my camera manually. I'm not quite sure where you mean select your camera manually. Um, sorry, I, I don't exactly follow the question. Apologies. Check your workspace. Um, I am PC. Uh, okay. Let's see here. For Windows, I had to drag and drop from the advanced list to my new palette. No drop down menu. Interesting. Someone, I'm sure someone's already confirmed for me the right click. Um, so yeah, someone has, Dennis says no, not there. Right click does show something, but not that. Fascinating. So according to Frank, um, or Frank, I had to drag and drop from the advanced list to my new palette, no drop down menu. Very interesting. So you went in here, you said, okay, I want lens sharpness. I can add that focal length. I can add that. That is extremely odd. I wonder if it's just, if that's a bug. That seems like a very strange thing to be missing. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for that. I um, mean, unfortunately, we don't have our DxO rep today who can actually um, potentially answer it when I don't don't have the answer to it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, ooh, we got to wrap this thing up. Let's see here. Um, okay. So um, Philip is saying that my camera uses CR2. That's Canon RAW. When I go to open the file, the app says it does not support S RAW and MRAW. Okay, so you're shooting Canon cameras. And I, I recall this from working with Canons before. At least some of them have an option to do a smaller RAW file, an SRAW, I guess a medium RAW. I'm guessing that's what MRAW is. It's not the full-size RAW file. And it sounds like PhotoLab is not supporting those. Um, what do you do? 
Um, unfortunately, the answer is to not shoot SRAR or MRAW. For your existing photos, you would have to open them in another app and then export it as a TIFF file. Um, you can't convert a RAW, like an SRAW into a full RAW file. So sorry about that. Um, okay, all right, that is it. We are going to, uh, oh, I'm going to answer Gary's question, the last question here, or I'm going to try to, and then we're, we have to wrap this. My transfer link from Adobe Lightroom to Photolab no longer works despite reinstalling DxO. Oh, interesting. So in what he's referring to is in, in Lightroom, you um, have an option to send to Photolab and a transfer to Photolab, something like that. It no longer works despite, and you've reinstalled Photolab. Hmm. I don't know. Because, yeah, that's part of the Photolab install process. I hate to say reinstall Lightroom, but that might be, you might need to do that. Weird. I don't know. Sorry. Um, email DxO support for that one. Okay. Thank you, everybody, ever so kindly for sticking around today and asking tons of awesome questions. I do appreciate that. I will, um, I will, um, I will say adieu. And I will see you in the next one, whenever that might be. I, I, I'm not actually sure what's scheduled next, but I will eventually. I'm Photo Joseph. Find me on the YouTubes. Find me on um, Twitter and the Facebooks and everywhere else at Photo Joseph. And I will see you guys in the next webinar. Toodles.